From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Russian link Gamerodon starts stealing data 30 to 50 minutes after initial compromise. New AI tool Worm GPT allows for sophisticated cyber attacks, and Microsoft is still unsure how hackers stole Azure Active Directory signing keys. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and most definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Dimitri Van Zantvliet, the CISO at Dutch Railways. Dimitri, thank you so much for being on the show. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me, Rich. Honored to be here. Yeah, I cannot wait to get into the news of the week with you. Before we do so, just have to thank our sponsor for today, OpenVPN, Secure Access and Network Connectivity Reimagined. Join us on YouTube Live. Remember to do so. Go to the web address, CISOseries.com, and your internet browser of choice. Hit the events dropdown and look for the cybersecurity headlines week in review image. It is the third one down. Just click on it. You can join us and get in on the comments. We love to have them. We've got about 20 minutes, though, so let's jump in. Russian link Gamerodon starts stealing data 30 to 50 minutes after initial compromise. Ukraine's computer emergency response team is warning that the Russian linked APT group is able to steal data from victims' networks in less than an hour after initial compromise. The group often uses spear phishing and social engineering emails and messages, things like Telegram, WhatsApp, and Signal, as an initial attack vector, and then using accounts that have been previously compromised. So, Dimitri, in the business of cybersecurity, time is always an issue, not breaking any news there. But does this new development raise the stakes in terms of adding greater power to threat actors? Or is that kind of uh, uh, speed after initial compromise something we're already used to? Well, in fact, uh, I think we uh, immediately uh, added some new paragraphs to our uh, vacancies, our incident responder vacancies. So next to having a CISP uh, certification, you need to run as fast as using uh, Bolt. It, uh, <laughs> I mean... This is just insane, right? These uh, speeds. Uh, so uh, if you if you also look at, uh, for example, the uh, the lightning speed of encryption that Lockbit Two uh, delivers, yeah, I think it's two hundred sixty six megabytes a second. Uh, it's you, you have to be really fast uh, in in detecting and and responding. So uh, it's all about automation, I, I guess. Uh, perhaps uh, AI in the future, um, orchestration, uh, and then kicking off your playbooks uh, right away. Uh, so automation, I think, is uh, is the the answer here, and and more important, uh, perhaps, is uh, encrypting your data so it uh, becomes useless. Yeah, it, I'm curious. Does this particular like time window, like 30 to 50 minutes, is that a? We always say security is cat and mouse game. It's like the oldest metaphor possible. But is this like uh, is this a a much faster mouse? Like does does this change the the paradigm or anything like that, or is this? I guess within the bounds of expectation. Well, you see the the speed increasing, uh, so I think it's uh, it will be uh, increasing uh, over the years uh, to mm-hmm. come. So I, I think it's uh, it's getting faster and faster. Yeah, we will we'll definitely have to see uh, if we'll see uh, new speed records going forward. But uh, yeah, with between this and ransomware, uh, ain't getting any easier anytime soon. Our next story here, new AI tool Worm GPT allows for sophisticated cyber attack. That's according to findings from Slash Next. Worm GPT has been advertised on underground forums as a way for adversaries to create highly convincing fake emails personalized to a recipient and thus increasing the chances of a successful attack. Slash Next security researcher Daniel Kelly added in his company's report that threat actors are promoting jailbreaks for ChatGPT, engineering specialized prompts and inputs that are designed to manipulate the tool into generating output that would have involved disclosing sensitive information, producing inappropriate content, executing harmful code. You know, Dimitri, we've seen this around more trivial things like old Windows activation keys or something like that. So it's not surprising to see threat actors with this. But I guess two concerns here. The first being, you know, a well-crafted social engineering and phishing emails. And then the second, you know, being the generation of wholesale malicious code, clearly a challenge for CISOs everywhere. I'm curious, what's your take on this development? I I, I seriously doubt if this is a a big thing uh, already. So um, we uh, we read the the news and uh, we saw a lot of clickbait and and FUD in all these uh, articles about warm GPT. Um, But... On the other side, it's not a surprise. We expected this uh, to come. Uh, there's uh, how, man, how many uh, thousands of, uh, if you look at the hugging face uh, this morning, 262,000 models. 
there's uh, 46 and a half thousand uh, data sets uh, to train those models. So I think this is a new market for uh, a dark web market, perhaps uh, you, with uh, rogue data sets to train models uh, to go uh, off rails. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a, it's a new mi business model, probably. Uh, not so so worried about uh, crafting uh, the the serious fishing mills with uh, AI uh, yet. Uh, if you're being uh, spearfished, uh, it's uh, you know made with OSINT already. So. Yeah, that that doesn't strike that it's changing the game necessarily. And I agree, a lot of the worm GPT, it was like people knew when they had a good headline, right? It's like we know GPT is going to get the clicks, but yeah, it's it's the start though of seeing this, uh, you know, these large language models just being part of the standard toolkit for threat actors. Uh, I think is is important to note and and to see. I honestly like the creativity. I hate to say that, but like. Threat actors are nothing if not insanely creative, and this is a tool that breeds creativity. So it it, it will be yeah, fascinating insane. to see how this develops over time too. And it, but it's very costly uh, to to train a model. So uh, I'm I'm wondering uh, who's able to which APT has uh, the uh, thousands of Nvidia's in the cloud uh, to uh, to do it. So well, especially, uh, and especially when we're seeing export restrictions to uh, exactly countries yeah. to prevent getting those tools for those but, purposes. Uh, you want to get some shares of NVIDIA. I think that's a good <laughs> For sure, for sure. All right, our next story here. Microsoft still unsure how hackers stole Azure Active Directory signing key. This is following up on last week's email breach story. An inactive Microsoft account consumer signing key was allegedly used by Chinese hackers to breach the Exchange Online and Azure Active Directory accounts of two dozen organizations, including government agencies using a stolen Azure AD enterprise signing key. Microsoft stated the method by which the actor acquired the key is a matter of ongoing investigation. And Microsoft admitted uh, th that was according to a new advisory they published last week. So, Dimitri, it seems that the threat actors have moved on since Microsoft invalidated the signing keys. But these types of incidents show that even the biggest organizations are prone to creative attacks. Do you see this as a good news story, seeing that no major damage seems to have been caused or still a cause for concern? Yeah, this is a, a very big uh, cause uh, for concern, uh, of course. Uh, and you see uh, these these large organizations getting bigger and bigger all the time. And uh, I think this week Microsoft announced that they are uh, moving into the SSE and SASE uh, area as well with Entra. So now you want to put all your eggs in their basket. Uh, you know that it's a big uh, big uh, concern actually. So. I think in the first place, uh, it's it's horrible enough to keep, uh, it's, it's difficult enough to keep the, the spies at bay, the Chinese spies. We don't need uh, Microsoft to lose, lose our keys as well. So in, in this, I think, uh, example is uh, bring your own key and keep your own key. Uh, it's, it's very important. Key management is uh, together with encryption, I think, uh, one of the things that we should uh, look into more um, yeah, rigidly. Uh, have more uh, data sovereignty, uh, for example. Uh, don't uh, leave your keys uh, laying about uh, at, at the supplier side, for example. So, you know, it's 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 good to use those big cloud uh, providers, and uh, but you know, we we need to have uh, the we meet, need to be the master of our own data. All right, our next story here, a little bit related to what we we're just talking about: Jump Cloud breached by an APT. Last week, we reported that the enterprise software company JumpCloud reset all customer API keys and would refer to as an ongoing incident, obviously resetting the keys, speaking to the severity of that. And now the company has disclosed a state-backed threat group breached its systems, it discovered the incident on June 27th, finding the attackers gained access a week prior with a spear phishing attack. The company discovered unusual activity in the commands framework for a small set of customers, but said it found no evidence the attack impacted any customers. Jump Cloud released indicators of compromise for the incident to better allow partners to secure their networks. Dimitri, with the recognition that it was the result of a spear phishing attack, the question, I guess, then becomes with AI becoming more dominant in all areas of, of life, or at least where we're trying to see where it fits in, not just threat actors. How can we use, you know, uh, large language models, AI, ML to better identify spear phishing and social engineering? Is that is that going to be part of the solution here? I think that's uh, definitely going to be part of the solution. We are already using uh, machine learning and anomaly detection uh, AI. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this particular case, uh, I wonder if that would have helped because, uh, as I understood, uh, it was the Lazarus uh, group from North Korea that was uh, aiming for the uh, 
the targets. Uh, it was spear, spear phishing, so probably they did some uh, investigation, and they're all about getting the uh, crypto coins. Uh, so uh, yeah. it's it's very, I mean, targeted uh, uh, from their point of view, and I don't think uh, they needed any AI to do that. So yeah, you you would still have the old craftsmanship uh, attacks going on, uh, especially in the uh, cryptocurrency uh, world. Yeah, when when it comes to being so targeted by a group that has the the time, the resources, and the inclination to to State focus sponsored. on one, yeah, it, it it's you can add to the toolkit and make it harder, uh, but uh, that that's still always going to be a, a tough ticket. I feel like no matter what what tools we put out there, for sure, definitely. All right, before we move on, now a word from our sponsor, Open VPN. According to Oriel Hernan Velabla Pinzetta, a system administrator with CEDEX Cybersecurity and IT Department, the pandemic meant we could not come to the office and we needed to facilitate access to our local resources. Cloud Connexa was really easy and fast to set up. Two things we really needed in that moment. Learn more about OpenVPN in the show notes to this episode. All right, this next story got a lot of play this week in the news. So, uh, Dimitri, definitely want your take on it. Typos leaking military emails. This comes from the Financial Times, and they reported that a common domain typo has implications for the U.S. military. It's because the .mil domain used by the military often gets typed as .ml. That's the country code for the West African country, Mali. This isn't theoretical either. The Dutch entrepreneur managing the domain, Johannes Zubier, set up a system to catch misdirected military emails to that .ml address. Since January, this captured over 117,000 emails, and those emails included very sensitive information, things like medical records, identity documents, military base photos, military itineraries, down to like room numbers that people were in, a lot of stuff in there. Uh, Zubier's contract to manage the domain expired this week, so Mali officials uh, could now theoretically access misdirected emails if they set up a similar system. Uh, so, Dimitri, I'm just curious here, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we have the situation here, kind of two interesting issues first the idea of you know misspelled emails we've seen typo squatting attacks for years this is kind of almost coming at from the other direction here uh just kind of taking advantage of typos uh but also the issue that these emails can be collected and abused with those with the insight to do so i'm curious what your take on this this is a very interesting uh, story i think uh, first of all because the department of defense uh, did not take proper action uh, for at least a decade so why did they continue to uh, to leak uh, to have all those emails sent to uh, to a rogue uh, email server, and then this guy from Amsterdam, uh, we all know him, uh, Joost Zubier, he's a, he's a, a serial uh, internet entrepreneur, and uh, so he he agreed, uh, I think, uh, 15 years ago or something, that uh, he could manage these uh, top level uh, country domains for uh, Mali, for example, for the Central African Republic, for Gabon. And also for Tokelau, and that's where it gets shady. So uh, Tokelau is the extension TK, and uh, actually it's the, the sewer of the internet because it's widely misused for spam campaigns, for setting up uh, CNC servers. And it's been going on for uh, also more than a decade. Uh, and now this particular guy, this entrepreneur uh, between brackets, he's being sued by Meta for $500 million. Uh, so... Uh, this story uh, hasn't ended yet, and and if you combine those two things, is uh, this is actually a very shady uh, operation, uh, and the Department of Defense didn't take any proper action. Then I will return the the question: is uh, why didn't you know why didn't they catch this guy, and why did they let him uh, you know uh, leak highly classified documents for so long, or catch highly document uh, classified documents for so long? So is this an asset or an operator of, uh, of uh, some uh, intelligence agency? Yeah, it's what what was been fascinating to me outside of you know uh, 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 Zubier's role in all of this is it kind of combines two things we always see on the show, right? We have it's almost the insider threat problem, right, of the typo. Uh, of, you know, people leaking e information, not even realizing it. And then on the other end, it becomes almost a third party vendor risk thing where people outside of DOD, even after they started blocking the .ml addresses inside DOD, sending in that information. What You know, I know, depending on the classification, they had trusted communication systems, but kind of coming at it from both ends of uh, 
uh, as a security issue, right? So even after DOD theoretically could have done ever done what they could have done on their end, they still have to realize like these typos exist for people sending stuff to us as well. So yeah. it's it, endlessly fascinating. Endlessly, and then you have your uh, very expensive uh, XDR, your MDR, your mm, yep. uh, your your SOC seams, your uh, DLP systems, and they still have uh, you know people that uh, mistyped things. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 uh, humans are undefeated in terms of being a security liability. <laughs> exactly. Shout out humanity. Keep on going. Our next story here, U.S. government launches IoT security labeling program. The Biden administration launched its long-awaited U.S. Cyber Trust Mark program, which aims to protect Americans from security risk associated with Internet of Things devices. The criteria were established by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. We know them as good old NIST. So far, the standards call for strong and unique default passwords, protection for data at rest and in transit, providing regular security updates, and having built-in incident detection capabilities. The Cyber Trustmark labeling system would take the form of a distinct shield logo. There's also a QR code element to kind of check for ongoing auditing, which will appear on the product that meets established cybersecurity criteria. So, Dimitri, the Biden administration uh, seems to be to be working hard kind of across uh, a lot of different angles to address cybersecurity concerns going across different agencies and regulations. This one's very much consumer centric. Uh, Cyber Trustmark looks like it would fit in well with other types of certifications. Do you feel that in this age, such a program would be, I guess, prone to abuse in some way? You know, we've seen Twitter blue check marks, for example, used to kind of game systems. Uh, could we see this as well on the consumer side? Yeah, definitely. I think every uh, system that you set up is prone for uh, misuse. But on the other side, it's, uh, it's I think, very uh, needed. Uh, sometimes we look at, uh, at Biden uh, with envy. He, uh, he issues uh, an executive order and everyone is running, uh, uh, you know, uh, to do their jobs, especially in the uh, critical infrastructure area, uh, but but we did the same in the in Europe in uh, 2019. We had the Cybersecurity Act, and mm -hmm. now we see uh, certification schemes uh, popping up for cloud, for example. That's the first one, and this week we had the uh, Cyber Resilience Act that was uh, agreed upon by all the European member states, uh, and that will uh, also uh, be all about uh, you know uh, keeping uh, IT, IoT, and and software systems uh, safe and uh, have them uh, certified or uh, self-assessment uh, uh, being done. Uh, yeah, people will uh, uh, try to uh, uh, fake it. Uh, and But, uh, you know, there's, there's, we, we need legislation. I think that's clear. Yeah, definitely. And it feels like this is one of the you know, for the longest time, IoT just seemed like the Wild West. We had so many white label makers out there that were just would, would sell a, a system on a chip to anybody. And yeah, it did work, but you know, the default password was baked in and just horrible. So you, you didn't know where anything was going. And it feels like between your right and the UK has had similar legislation uh, as well, uh, that this is hopefully bringing that realization that, hey, we need to have some sort of standards if these are going to be living in, in people's and organizations' homes, you know, for years and years, that there's some expectation of basic security guidelines, right? Exactly. All right. Our next story here, renewable technologies could pose a risk to U.S. electrical grid. At a congressional hearing on Tuesday this week, former Assistant Secretary of Defense Paul Stockton warned that inverters that underpin solar and wind energy storage systems present potential hacking risks. Inverters convert uh, DC electricity generated by solar panels into AC that can be used by the electrical grid. Stockton said inverters are a major point of weakness since the equipment is digitally native and because China is a major major manufacturer of many of those devices. While inverters currently only account for roughly 14% of total electricity generation, the threat vector is expected to expand in the coming years as hopefully we get more solar capacity. Uh, you know, Dimitri, this is a, a new age of, uh, a, I guess, a new variation on an old threat. Uh, you know, we've had discarded inverters playing the role currently held by I don't know, unpatched legacy software, for an example. I'm curious, do you see this as a genuine concern or, you know, uh, the energy industry is not uninterested in uh, the the uh, the renewable sector? You know, there's a lot of interest groups in there. Is this FUD or do you see this as a genuine concern? Well, I wouldn't exclude uh, some people use it at, as, uh, as FUD, uh, but uh, this is absolutely a legitimate concern. Uh, we are heavily investing uh, all over Europe in uh, in uh, solar panels and in uh, converters, and uh, most of them are uh, reliant on uh, Chinese uh, technology uh, behind it. Uh, not only uh, baked in, but also uh, the uh, 
the back end. Uh, so uh, I, I think the European Commission recently also proposed the Net Zero Industry Act. And this allows uh, European governments to heavily subsidize uh, local uh, technology initiatives in this uh, green, uh, you know, green uh, energy development area. So I think it's very necessary to be uh, a, a little bit uh, less uh, dependent on uh, Chinese, but also American uh, providers and have some uh, European uh, solutions uh, at hand. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, having, uh, you know, kind of domestic uh, uh, solutions out there, at least uh, closer to your own supply chain, right, uh, are going to be critical uh, for exactly. these kind of things. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, before we get out of here, I wanted to thank all of our commenters that we had in our live stream today. I had a, one comment here from uh, David Cross, kind of breaking news here. I uh, he says more and more details are coming out about the Microsoft AD key theft. Uh, so, you know, kind of breaking as we were prepping for the show today. And he says, uh, Wiz published something about this this morning. So we'll, be, of course, be following that up uh, on uh, cybersecurity headlines uh, as more details come out. So make sure uh, if you're just watching the live stream, make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get all that. Before we get out of here, Dimitri, was there any story that was a thumbs up or an eye roller here for you? And uh, what was it? I think this week, uh, uh, the, the passing of uh, Kevin Mitnick was a, a, an eye roller for uh, all of us. So uh, I think uh, he, his family and, uh, and friends uh, are in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, and the cybersecurity icon uh, has, le has left us. So, yeah, yeah. definitely. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, talk about someone who uh, has you know raised awareness for a lot of things. Obviously, uh, uh, yeah, it just kind of an icon uh, in the cybersecurity field. So yes, uh, uh, rest in power, Kevin Mitnick, and uh, uh, you will your name will live on. Uh, before we get out of here, also, I want to thank you, Dimitri, so much for being on the show, for having the great takes, bring in that European perspective that we always need here uh, in the CISO series and on the Weekend Review. Where can people find you online if they are so inclined? I think mainly on uh, LinkedIn. I'm, uh, yeah. All right. Well, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And is Dutch Railways hiring? Oh, yeah, definitely. So can we share a link in the... We, we will have a notes? link to the, to the postings in the show notes for sure. Yeah, if you Perfect. have some open positions. Yeah, always always love to share the love and uh, share some openings. We need uh, some new cyber people. people. Excellent, excellent. So we will have all of that in our show notes. Thanks also to our sponsor, OpenVPN, Secure Access and Network Connectivity Reimagined. Uh, thanks to everyone that was watching the live stream. Truly appreciate all the comments. Remember, we are on YouTube. So if you're listening to this later, you can join us 3.30 p.m. Eastern every single week. Get in on the conversation. We love to see you. Remember, you can also join us next Friday for Super Cyber Friday, where our topic will be hacking bad permissions, an hour of critical thinking about the domino effect of unknown access settings. And we'll be back next week with another episode of the Week in Review show. Can't wait to get some more uh, expert commentary on the news of the week. And if you need your daily news fix, you can get it through cybersecurity headlines every single day. Give us about six minutes. We'll get you all caught up. Until the next time we meet, I am Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.